Welcome back to Cultivating Change, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Corey, and it's my mission to bring the most practical, easy steps you can integrate in your day-to-day -day life to fully express your given genetic birthright and optimize for performance, whatever that means to you. We are down at my second microgreen uh, farm today, and we have as a guest, uh, per everyone's request, to start doing more interviews uh, and digging into everyone's story and what they found on their path to success. We have a performance coach and a uh, classmate in my primal health coach program, Deepak Saini. Deepak, if you just want to give a little bit of introduction, uh, as we were chatting about before we started, um, I found your your interview on primal health coach radio with Aaron Power and Laura Rupsis, and you have a broad history. You've lived in two worlds, kind of like me, my background's in tech and infrastructure, and it uh, sounds like your background's in accounting and the corporate world, so two worlds combined, and uh, just give a little brief history as to how you ended up in, in health for yourself and, and empowering other people to their journey from accounting. Sure. Uh, first of all, Alex, thank you for having me on. I really uh, appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Uh, I'll be I'll be really brief here. Uh, sure. I don't want to bore people <laughs> with my backstory, and I've talked about it a number of times before. But long story short, uh, you know, I always had a lot of health challenges growing up. Uh, you know, I was always the chubby kid, so I was struggled with weight my entire life, as far back as I can remember. Uh, autoimmune condition. You know, I get sick all the time. Uh, allergies. You name it. Uh, all, all the way through. So yes, as you're right, I, I went to school to uh, be a, an accountant, professional accountant. I still hold my designation. It took a lot to get it, so I uh, I, uh, I maintain it. I just do the the bare minimum, but I don't I don't practice that anymore, obviously. But uh, yeah, so st struggled with things up and down, weight loss. Uh, at my heaviest, I was about 275, so well over 100 pounds heavier than I am uh, right now. Uh, and you know. Here and there, and kind of you know that 2030 swing, uh, you know, continuously that a lot of people can uh, relate with, I'm sure. Uh, I got uh, a number of years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I got into running as a as a way to think, uh, oh, maybe that's how I lose the last X pounds, uh, type of thing. And I'm actually I wasn't a, a bad, and 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 weight did come off, but I you know kind of became. Uh, you know, people's, people are familiar with the term skinny fat, uh, right? So uh, my arms and my legs got pretty lean, but still had the spare tire around my, my midsection. Mm -hmm. uh, but all that pounding, all that chronic cardio, people also probably heard that term, uh, really broke me down. Uh, not only was I still getting sick all the time and, and, and whatnot, and I had started working with a naturopathic doctor to try and work on the autoimmune stuff. And it was, we were moving in the right direction. But uh, long story short, uh, one day I just, all that pounding, leading into a marathon, uh, half marathon, excuse me. Uh, I just bent over to pick up like nothing and just felt a little something in my back. And that was the start of, uh, of uh, the down spiral. And of course, being stubborn and, you know, having to prepare for a race that was upcoming, I just took a bit of rest, didn't properly rest, hit it the next weekend, do that for a couple of weeks and pretty soon you, you can't move. So I basically had no flexion in my back. So I couldn't bend over. So I couldn't tie my shoes, couldn't put on the socks. Oh, wow. It was very hard uh, getting in and out of a chair. That includes the toilet. Uh, but the real sort of down, the, the real rock bottom, if you will, was uh, my youngest daughter was just a baby at the time. I couldn't even pick up a 10 pound baby uh, out of her crib. Uh, you know, I could sort of gingerly sit into a chair my wife could place her in my arms and we could play, but I couldn't even stand up with a baby. I was afraid like I drop her or something like that. So uh, I was, I wasn't running anymore. I wasn't golfing, which is another thing I used to like to do. And I mm -hmm. couldn't pick up my daughter. So uh, I didn't see it in myself at the time, but uh, uh, you know, looking in now in hindsight, like I totally had depression, you know, couldn't do all those things, constant pain, just doing enough to get to work pain all the time, you know, moving and wiggling in your chair, you know, cause you're just always uncomfortable, always that low line, uh, uh, pain, et cetera. So, uh, you know, went to see the, you know, traditional medical system. They had no answers for me. A lot of misdiagnoses, a lot of mm -hmm. shots and injections that were, uh, not useful at all, you know, start seeing chiropractor, uh, physiotherapist, et cetera, et cetera, not really making much pro uh, acupuncturist, not really making much progress. Finally, I got so fed up with it. I'm like, I'm paying for an MRI, uh, out of my own pocket. So just, you know, basically the next day 
went and uh, got one done and properly diagnosed finally with MRI. Uh, I have degenerative disc disease in my L5, uh, uh, L, uh, sorry, L4, L5, L5, S1. Oh, wow. So low back. So now it's like, okay, now we know what the problem actually is, where the pain's coming from. Uh, you know, physiotherapist's like, okay, well, we can't really do anything for, for that. We can just make the, you know, surrounding muscles stronger, you know, to compensate uh, the core stronger, but can't do anything much about that. So uh, I'd already slowly dived into the world of performance, uh, even the world of biohacking uh, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I'd heard about PRP. So I looked into that, uh, talked to my naturopathic doctor, and she referred me to a, another doctor uh, and got that done. And uh, I saw small improvements uh, doing a, a number of rounds of that. plasma? Pla PRP? Platelet rich plasma. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if people don't know, I'll just quickly ex explain sure. is that they, uh, you know, they do a blood draw of your own blood, uh, put it in a centrifuge, spin it. So it separates all the components. They take the platelets, which are, you know, very. Uh, Different density. Very energy dense. Yeah, I would say. And then they inject back at site. So again, I've seen mar small marketing. Print. It's not an inexpensive procedure, especially when you're paying for it uh, out of pocket. <laughs> so um and, and they told me low back is tricky. They said, this might take three or four, like shoulder, ankle, usually one time you're good. Low back's tricky, it might take three or four. Uh, I ended up having to do eight uh, before I felt like I was good. Uh, and then I subsequently did two sort of, let's call it maintenance shots uh, afterwards. But in between all these, I'm just getting more into the research. I'm digging in, I'm digging in, you know, all the literature. Uh, so in between uh, shot or, or at the start of shot four, like I'm doing the blood draw, talking with the doctor, I was like, hey, does this make sense? You tell me, like, I, I'm an accountant, you know, I'm, I'm new to this, you know, kind of medical research, so it's called. Am I understanding this correctly that if, if you bring inflammation down, you know, it should help everywhere, right? But if you, you know, and, and we're, we're injecting the PRP at site, but if I have inflammation somewhere else, potentially it's getting diverted, right? And if there was low inflammation, it would work better, the procedure. Am I understanding the science, right? Like, do I get this? And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. You, you totally understand that. So he must've read the expression on my face because I was about to like yell at him, like, why the heck didn't you uh, tell me this before we went into procedure one to bring inflammation down? Uh, so he apologized saying, you know, quite honestly, most people, you know, won't change their diet, won't change their lifestyle. Uh, and kind of just stopped telling people because they want the magic pill. They want the magic bullet. I said, listen, you don't understand. I'm not golfing. I'm not running. I can't pick up my daughter. I'll do whatever. So I dropped cold Turkey that day. Uh, it was too late for, for that procedure. Like we're, I was right at the office, but I just cold Turkey started eating clean. And we can talk what that means, but you know, it's evolved over time for sure. I'm sure. Uh, and uh, so I did that for two weeks post procedure. It's like, yeah, maybe I felt a little better. It's kind of hard, hard to tell. Like, is it just because now it's the fourth shot and I'm getting incrementally better? Is it the inflammation? I don't know. Two weeks go by, kind of fall into old habits. Okay, I still want to do another shot, book it. Then it's like, oh, geez, two weeks until my next procedure. Oh, maybe I should start eating clean leading up to it. So I have two weeks clean up to the procedure, two weeks after. Oh, okay, I think it worked better. A little bit more range of motion. So basically bending over. Uh, was my sort of my gauge of how my back is feeling. Um, and then it kind of dawned on me, like, why are you doing the cycle of like eating clean and going back to garbage, eating clean? So I was like, I'm just going to eat clean for, you know, now go forward uh, type of thing. And uh, yeah, so eventually, like I said, my back felt better. I felt like it stopped the treatments. Uh, definitely inflammation down. But uh, <laughs> here's the kicker. So I, I, for someone who struggled with the weight their whole life, I was never really, I mean, I had a scale, but I wasn't really one to like jump on the scale and check every day or even weekly or, you know, kind of periodically type of thing. Uh, as life goes, sometimes when you've got young kids, uh, the corporate world, et cetera, et cetera, kind of get behind on the laundry, grab a pair of pants from the back of the closet you haven't worn in a while, put them on. And I was like, gosh, what the heck? So I call my wife. I'm like, I think I might've lost some weight. Like these pants are like really big. And she's like, what are you an idiot? Of course you've lost weight. Like you can totally see it in your face. I, did, I didn't even really realize it. Uh, so I'm like, oh geez, get up the scale, blow the dust off, get on it. It's like, yeah, in a short amount of time, I lost the last, you know, 50, 60 pounds that I was uh, holding on to. People started noticing at work, making comments, you know, my clothes almost now, they don't fit. They're too baggy. Uh, you know, you got clothes that are too big. You got to cinch the belt up a bit tighter. I'd run into people I hadn't seen in a while. I'm like, hey, how's it going? They wouldn't recognize me. 
Uh, you know, I keep my hair pretty short, but uh, they, uh, you know, once they kind of realized who I was, uh, like, oh, how's it going? Good. Yeah. Where are you working now? Et cetera. How are the kids? Blah, blah, blah. And then they lean in, you know, maybe touch me and they're like, are you okay? Like so many people thought I had cancer because I lost weight. So, and I, you know, keep my hair nice and short. Right. I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm like feeling the best I ever have, you know, type of thing. So that was just my, my change to my sort of the, the lightning bolt, if you will. And then after having so many people, can I take you for a coffee? Can I buy you a lunch? Like, what'd you do? And I was like, oh, I'll read this article. And I'm pretty soon I realized like, I like this a lot more yeah. helping people than I do working as an accountant. So yeah, I, you know, I stewed on that for a while, but uh, you know, long story short, uh, I eventually, you know, started as a side hustle, you know, uh, as a doing that on a, you know, got some, you know, coursework courses done, et cetera, evenings and weekends, lunch hours, et cetera. And then a number of years ago, I went full-time uh, coaching that there's a lot there the low back pain is near and dear because every three months or so uh, my my other life is a personal trainer and it's probably the one thing that almost everyone has some form of low back pain probably not degenerative disc disease but tweak your low back so easily and it always seems to happen when you're not prepared. So it usually doesn't happen at the gym because you warm up and you prepare and you brace and you do your form. It's usually moving when you're not adequately uh, preparing for it. So like helping people move furniture or doing yard work. Um, do you have any practices around uh, prevention or maintenance of like core strength to help your low back, just not on the disease front, but just so you maintain um, good lower back health. I suppose. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer that sort of two ways. So, mm -hmm. so first from a sort of physical point of view, um, when I was going through that rehab before we sort of figured out what was really going on with me, you know, work with two physiotherapists, chiropractor. So I have a whole routine that we've, we developed and I work with it too. You steal a little bit from, you know, other people, you, you, you hear a Paul check or somebody like that. And you're like, well, what about this? Oh yeah. And we modify some exercises. So I have a whole routine uh, that if I, you know, take my time, go through it, and I, and it's basically a, a core strengthening routine. So I don't do abs. I do this stretching. I call it my stretching routine because it takes the whole core into account. And for me, core is like knees to shoulders. Right. That's what I consider core, right? Uh, not just abs. So it takes me a good 45 minutes every day. Now, if I'm in a rush or I'm feeling good or whatever circumstance, I can sort of, you know, whittle it down to 20 minutes and just kind of rush through it quickly or not do as many cycles of a certain exercise, but otherwise it's 45 minutes. And I do that daily. That is imperative for me to be able to function how I want to function, to be as present as I can be uh, for my own goals, for my family, for my kids, or, and for my clients uh, as well. So that's imperative to me. So that's number one from the physical point of view. Number two is just try and identify all the areas of inflammation or mm -hmm. kryptonite uh, for myself and uh and just trying to eliminate those as best as possible and sometimes you're going to indulge whatever those might be but when you do indulge indulge it with intention knowing okay i might not feel so good tomorrow but i'm choosing mm -hmm. to do this i'm choosing to have uh alcohol i'm choosing to have uh the pizza for my daughter's birthday party because that's what she wanted to have etc and i take the same approach working with my clients as well so so i, I think so that's answer, healthy and, yeah uh, i think i watched uh mark sisson who's the kind of the godfather of um, the school of thought that, that we're trained under. He had a good podcast with uh, Sean, um, Model Health Show, Sean Stevenson. And it was basically what you just said is you're going to do it. You're going to indulge because that's part of life and you want to get full enjoyment. But as long as you put the intention into it and are fully present, like if you're just enjoying some birthday cake, first bite's going to be amazing because it's novelty. Second bite's going to be slightly less amazing third bite probably will have worn off and then decide if you still want to eat the whole thing because it's that it's that enjoyment and pleasure if you're going to do it fully immerse into the experience and enjoy it but once it no longer holds that sway right what's the what's the point and you know enjoy every bite of it and then realize what it's going to do and see if it's worth it yeah alex can i share one thing uh, i just oh, want sure. to sort of complete that thought is 
So yes, I, I totally agree. Like with intention, I don't really buy into everything in moderation, and maybe that's a topic we can get I don't into either. later. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think that's a bunch of BS. But yes, with intention. But that being said, that doesn't mean you can't do practices or hacks to prepare your body to take that as well. I.e., okay, I know I'm going here. This is what's they're going to serve. Okay, I'm going to fast all day. You know, right. and that'll be my one meal. Or I'm going to take some sort of supplement to to control uh, uh, blood sugar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, again, not it's not that it's all about like hacking things or, or or whatever, but certainly you can have intention. But let's you know, let's use some science and some technology at the same time as well. Oh yeah, I'm with you. A lot of my um, my daily posts because that's usually the hits the most people. And that's what a lot of people kind of want. They're just like, I'm going to do this because I want to enjoy life. So how do I mitigate the damage? And exactly like you said, it's um, rev up your metabolism beforehand. So whenever it hits you, you use it immediately. So give yourself a little bit of a buffer or apple cider vinegar uh, works well to just like um, get the sugar into your cells immediately. So it's not just circulating. There's a couple of walking right after we're just doing a light uh, routine right after to sort of use that burst of energy. You're still going to get a little of the inflammation, but it won't linger for hours, probably like it would have, or even a weekend for some people, if they're, I'm hypersensitive just because, uh, I've been doing clean eating, like you said for a bit. So if I have a night of debauchery, so just like a regular pizza or maybe like two slices of cake, it will hurt for I won't be able to perform at the level I want to for probably two days, which is obnoxious at this point and seems like people should recover faster than that. But if you're just aware of your baseline and what you can do, you just notice it more. So probably most people would be like, ah, I just didn't feel good for two days. But at some point, if you're used to sort of just a, a stable energy level, yeah, it just hurts and, and it becomes not worth it. So I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. There. What, what, what supplements what, do you like? Yeah. Can I just, so once sure. I'll answer your question there, else. One thing. So what I find uh, too, is that, um, you know, it's, it's about, I don't know how to put this, you know, yeah, just, just know. Yeah. Like you said, knowing your, your, your balance, knowing your baseline uh, type of thing. I found over time, I've gotten more sensitive as the longer I've been, cleaning. So, you know, uh, even just yesterday, we were, we had some work done at the house and, and some, uh, sort of the, the chemical cabinet, let's call it. We had to take some stuff out to, to fix something back there and then put it back and not like anything got opened, but obviously there's always a little residue, just that little bit of chemical smell. I just felt like so off. I'm just like, that wouldn't have bothered me 10, 12 years ago. I am so sensitive now. And my wife sometimes make, makes fun of me like, Oh, you're such a snowflake. Now I was like, Hey, like I'm optimized. The more optimized you get, the more sensitive, I think. Yeah, you 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 become, uh, and uh, if I could share one story, Alex. I don't want to make this look. Oh this no, go for it. I love stories. So, so a number of years ago, my wife's family they've uh, been on the same uh, uh, farming the same same homestead for over a hundred years. Wow. So the local municipality, uh, you know, gave them this award for over a hundred years farming the same piece of land in the same family, whatever. So they took that as an opportunity to have like a big, big party, you know type of thing. So all the family got, you know, invited, you know, who've now all spread around all over the place, right? We, we live in, you know, uh, you know, in the city and everything. So, you know, we had to go, go down like three hour drive and then all the neighbors and everything. So anyway, it was a great big afternoon barbecue in the summer, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going there where, you know, I'm very careful with what I'm having as far as, you know, alcohol, you know, again, it's a party. So with intention, uh, you know, only eating certain things, avoiding other things. But then, you know, you got all these like desserts that all the grandmas and the great aunts and everything made, right? So I'm taking like the thinnest little slice, oh, like fresh strawberry rhubarb pie. So I'm gonna have a try, oh, fresh peach pie. So I got like, you know, the thinnest little slice I can cut, but of like three or four different pieces of pie. My, <laughs> my uh, wife's cousin's uh, husband, he's like, I didn't think that was part of your diet plan. I was like, hey, look, man, like it isn't. This isn't a special occasion, but I guarantee you tomorrow, my left knee is going to be so stiff. I'm going to be hard to move. Right. So we enjoy our night. We go stay at the hotel. And then that next morning we have a breakfast with a smaller subset of the family. Same person who asked me that question there. He's like, so how was your knee? I'm like, and it was actually so I, this had never happened to before that point. I woke up that morning and my hands were so stiff. Like I couldn't even, I'm like, that's not usually my usual MO. It's usually my knees. So I was like, Oh geez, what the heck? So right away, 
throw on the gym clothes, go to the gym, sweat it out, get on the elliptical, you know, whatever, do a couple laps in the pool, hot shower, boom, good to go. And so then he asked me, I was like, actually, it was my hands. So yeah, like, you you know, you know, everyone knows what their thing is. They might not recognize it at first, but they, everyone knows what their thing is. So yeah, inflammation shows up in weird ways. A lot of time, it'll be stiffness. And I know a lot of people uh, well enough where sometimes I think people attribute seasonal pressure changes to inflammation from diet. They're just like, oh, this hurts, or this hurts, but it's probably barometric pressure changes. And I was like, mm, you have that happen a lot. It might, <laughs> might be something else. I mean, right. yeah, I could, yeah, skin care. I see a lot of skin care, people like breaking. I'm like, that's inflammation. Like you're of a certain age, you're not going through puberty anymore. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I'm, I mean, there's a hormonal thing, of course, sure. right? You know, especially for women that like can't discount that. But when it's, you know, more frequent than it should be like that's inflammation so your face is a good good barometer just because your skin cells and your fit well a the blood vessels are so close so you can see changes in dilation and the skin cells in your face turn over the quickest so it's kind of a reflection i treat it as a reflection of your internal world kind of Absolutely. so if you see people Absolutely. with like obscene rosacea or i mean some people just have um have that but if it's consistent and doesn't really go away and you're just like you always seem a little inflamed and they're like well i have a headache a lot too so there's a lot of factors that i think people just deal with unfortunately and they're just like yeah that's just how the cookie crumbles but yeah okay so much there to unpack yeah so you asked me about supplements you want me to come back yeah what do you what do you use as a preventative if you're going to go enjoy yourself for a little bit what's your sort of prevention yeah so i'll definitely fast as i mentioned yes. earlier uh and then i will have apple cider vinegar for sure bitter yep. melon extract um uh what's the other one i take um oh, it's escaped me at the moment it'll come to me later uh so that that's certainly those uh for sure yeah try and get some movement afterwards right. cold if possible i live in canada so it's not hard to get uh cold <laughs> yeah. uh after a meal or, or just even just move you know quite often for even with family like okay instead of chatting with all the adults, I'll go play with the kids afterwards, you know, just to get some movement going, uh, you know, maybe it's not a walk because sometimes it's, it's not appropriate to just leave and I go for a walk uh, type of thing. And then, you know, depending, you know, if I'm, uh, uh, you know, at a restaurant, you know, it's like, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to get bad oils. You're maybe going to have a couple of drinks. So it's like, okay, I'll, you know, have some activated charcoal. You know, I was going to say charcoal or yeah. and, and stuff like that. So perfect. Okay. Um, I'll take some chlorella and, you know, things like, so a lot of binders, things like that. So. I haven't heard that one in a bit. Um, yeah. It used to be all about uh, broken cell wall, chlorella and spirulina when I went um, vegetarian. That was my early twenties. And then I was just combining everything. When you do that, you have no idea what's working. So if you don't have charcoal, if it's chlorella or if it's cilantro, any chelators, but it's all good. So it's, right. It's all binding heavy metals and hopefully grabbing some of the, uh, the oxidative damage. What are your, because I'm going to forget about this, and I want to know exactly what you mean. What are your no-goes? So you said, I'm not a huge fan of moderation, and neither am I. There's a couple of things I just say, nope, get rid of it. What are yours? Uh, industrial seed oils. That's yeah, like okay. number one. Uh, we don't have that in the house. Um, we cook with mostly with coconut oil. Yep. Uh, we've tried, we've done ghee. I mean, I'm East Indian background, uh, mm -hmm. half East Indian. So I, I personally don't even like the taste of ghee, honestly. So we've tried it. It's kind of weird. So, yeah. So it's mostly coconut oil, uh, a high quality, like we go to the specialty store to get the high quality olive oil, but that's a dressing or a dipping sauce or something like that. Uh, yeah. So probably industrial seed oils is, is definitely the no go. It's not in our household. Uh, I'm the type of guy who, and that's just me. I mean, I don't make my kids or my wife do it or anything. It's just me. But like, I will take my own balsamic and olive oil to like restaurants or to other people's houses oh, that's uh, a good or, idea. What, or whatever, you know, and people, people, you know, that we regularly frequent, they just know, don't put dressing on it. Deepak, can you take your set, your, your salad out? And then, then they'll make whatever their dish they're making or that's a good uh, idea. whatever. So I, you know, I do that. I'll bring salt with me, pepper, you know, good quality, you know, type of things. Uh, yeah, that was probably, I mean, there's a place for sugar, you know, depending on what you're doing, there's a place for sugar alternatives. So we use a lot of other things. Uh, we don't eat a ton of, of sweets. Um, you know, sometimes you just even just use a banana, a ripe banana or applesauce or something for, for sweetening. We don't do a lot of that kind of stuff in our household anyway. I can't control when we go to other places, but uh, you know, it's 
my I'm just making something up here. It's my nephew's birthday party. Uh, it's like that looks like a really good like dark chocolate cake. Like I'll I'll have a piece, but I'll then I'll do those mitigation techniques we talked about earlier, right? Gotcha. Um, grains is one of the ones that I try to get rid of, but that's a culturally sensitive thing oh, for a lot of people like I, lentils and beans in some cultures are like a staple so it's real hard to mitigate those is is the indian culture one of those yeah so i thank you for bringing that on. i can't believe i forgot grains that's fine uh yeah so no in the indian culture for sure so uh, my you know my dad's side of the family yes uh uh lentils chickpeas kidney beans even etc so i ate a lot of that growing up maybe that caused part of it uh to a degree, my parents still make that a little bit. My wife, you know, she likes having a chili or something with some kidney beans and whatever in there. Um, I try and pick them out or she'll make the meat part and I'll take mine out and then she'll mix it up. I, I just, over time, I'm just, again, back to that, I'm really sensitive now. I don't do good with legumes at all. Uh, I don't eat grains at all unless it's one of those occasions that I mentioned where it's like, okay, my daughter wants to have pizza. Okay, when I was fat and sick, pizza was my favorite food. Right. It's still my favorite food. It's like the most yummiest thing to me, but got to be, I got to just watch it. Right. So again, with intention, whatever. So, but I don't eat bread. I don't eat rice. Uh, you know, again, it depends. Like a lot of times on a weekend, we tend to do grocery shopping on the weekend. My daughter loves sushi, my older daughter. So my wife will bring some sushi home and that'll be her lunch. And she's like, Oh dad, you want like a roll or like a something? And I was like, okay, I've just finished working out, you know, muscle glycogen's depleted. You know, I'm going to still have my eggs and avocado and maybe bacon or something. And then to finish it off, okay, I'll have a little bit of rice with that piece of sushi. Like, I'm not worried about that. Right. But I don't eat bread. I don't eat buns. You know, and with the exception, probably the only grains I really ever eat is, again, pizza crust, you know, every couple of weeks or something. Yeah, that, yeah, that's mirrors what I do. And I found this is super strange. Uh, and like you said, your wife calls you a snowflake. I am the uh, delicate houseplant to my friends because I need a very, very precise food, water, like everything about it. It's, it's kind of obnoxious. And a lot of people notice that about um, health coaches in general is they're like, you guys are very restrictive. And you're like, it's not restrictive. It's I know what won't make me feel good. So I just avoid those things. But, and the chili rang so true because chili is probably one of my favorite childhood foods or was, um, my mom made the best chili and I can't do kidney beans anymore. I can get away with pinto and black beans. Those are okay. They'll, they'll create a little discomfort, but kidney beans will be like, I'll be in pain, like uh, gastrointestinal pain. And it's so strange, even within families of grains or plants, just minor variations make such a drastic difference for some people. Like chickpeas are absolutely fine. And I think, um, Mark's Daily Apple did a little uh, expose on that. They're like, hummus is fine if you get it without canola oil because chickpeas, inter they have such a small amount of lectin in them and most people tolerate them. And hummus is just such a good, quick, easy food <laughs> that they let that one in. If, especially if you make it yourself and you can do- Google Yeah, you know, I, I, went, I went through a stint there where I made my own hummus, yeah. you know, and again, you'd like, it's like, well, I don't want to just make this much. I want to make a big batch worth. And then you couldn't even eat it fast enough before it go back because there's no preserves in it. Exactly. But I actually found that even my own hummus, you know, I, I just buy for, for convenience sake, like store-bought, you know, as much as you try and drain it, I wasn't like sprouting them myself or anything. I still found that caused me issue. So I was like, yeah, they just need to go. So I'm, I'm just not, not doing it. My wife sometimes, again, bless her heart, who tries to make a lot of modifications for us. So she's tried like black bean chocolate brownies type of thing, but they still, they still bother me. So I'm like, okay, as long as the kids are eating them, it's a healthier choice for them. Great. But you know, I appreciate right. the effort, honey. I'm going to have a small piece, but I'm not going to eat anymore because like it, it just still affects me, right? So. Do you find that your your nutrition pattern has gotten overly simplified over the years where you just don't really care about as much variation and probably your palate adapted too? Did you notice any like dramatic changes in, in taste of food as you're going through your, your Yeah, so I, I think uh, maybe this is an age thing or is there some other you know, uh, biological impact that I'm not really cl clicking in on, but like I certainly can't handle it as spicy food as I did when I was younger. But uh, yeah, no, I, there isn't a lot of versions. I basically have essentially, again, I, I, so I intermittent fast. So I, uh, you know, I haven't even eaten yet today. So I have like two meals a day. 
sometimes one, but it's 16, usually eight. what's your definition of IELTS? Yeah, I mean it depends on the day, but yeah, okay. let's call it 16 eight. Sometimes it's like 18. Yep. You know, if I know like I got a busy day and if I don't eat now, I'm not gonna eat for six hours and then that'll be terrible, like I'll be hangry later or whatever, right? So it it, it varies, but it, roughly 16 eight. But I basically have the same breakfast every day, regardless of where I am. Like I could be on vacation and I can still sort of figure it out most part. Dinner is a little bit more variable, uh, but again, it's a ton of vegetables, whether that's salad and or broccoli or something and some meat, you know, some, you know, it doesn't change a lot, you know, so one day it's steak, one day it's chicken, one day it's pork, back to steak, hamburgers, whatever. You know, so it doesn't change a lot. So there's, to your point, very little variation. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fine with that because you can always change up the sauce. You can change up spicing and it's, it's a different exactly. thing, right? Yeah. And I find most, most of my clients actually, well, they're men for one, they like that because most people have better things to do and they're doing, or they're thinking about trying to get the uh, sort of bulletproof nutrition under the belt so that they don't have to think about it. Be like, figure out the foods that will fuel me for the day that are anti-inflammatory or at least not causing inflammation that will keep me satiated and then forget about it. Like get maybe two or three different, different um, options you can interchange if you want a little variation, like you said, different sauces, different spices, and then just move on. Like it's, there's more to life in my view than food. So I try to just simplify everything as much as possible, just yeah, so I have yeah. enough energy and then just get on with it. And that, that's my approach. Some people take it to the other end where they're going for different like neurologic properties if they're doing a lot of nootropics or doing um, cognitive performance, they'll get very nitpicky about food. And I like all of that, but if it interferes with all my other projects and things I'm interested in, it's kind of a turnoff for me. So I just try to simplify everything as much as possible. I don't know if you're similar. Yeah, no, for, definitely in, in our household for sure. And then even when I work with my clients, uh, quite often a lot of my clients are, you know, uh, have families or married, whatever, and they're probably not always the primary, most often they're not. So it's just like, okay, like, and it's, they're the client, not their wife, right? It's like, okay, well, what if you just make some small tweaks? Like, see if your wife is open to cooking with coconut oil instead of the canola. Okay. And then, you know, just slowly build on little things. And, you know, it's like, well, okay, your, your wife made whatever potatoes. And it's like, well, have a little bit more salad or have a little bit more of the broccoli and just take a little bit less potatoes or what, whatever the thing may be. Or, you know, do you really need a dinner roll? You know, like, you know, just make some little tweaks. And then over time, they're like, yeah, I can, I don't need that. I don't need that. And then not always, but sometimes it just, it's a trickle effect, right? Like, yeah, I find that even, even my family, my extended family, right? It's like, nobody has the extreme as me, the, the people that we hang out with right. a lot, but over time, they've all made small, tiny little changes that, have, you know, and it's not, you know, no one's perfect, uh, but you know, those little changes are helping them in the long term, right? Oh, yeah, totally agree. When I, uh, when I'm working with other people, uh, Mondays at the farm and garden store, I'm, I'm at, uh, what you do definitely other people notice and are curious about, like you said. So the, the one thing that was well, a couple of things, but mirroring what you just said with small changes, I will still eat the food. Like if, if the company is paying for lunch and it's like tamales or, um, fajitas or sushi, like you mentioned earlier, I'll still eat it and just pick out the thing that I know will kill me. So like, if it's a burger, I won't eat the bread. If it's uh, tamales, I just won't eat the wrapping. And people are just like, do you think that really makes a difference? And I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> and then I'll see them do it like two weeks later. And they're like, oh, I don't have the lethargy, like the post-meal slump. Yeah. And I was like, right. There are some things that contribute more to that than others. It's very interesting, just little yeah. changes in diet. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in, uh, I've gone to like presentations uh, for, you know, business opportunities, what, what have you, doesn't really matter, where it's a catered lunch or something. It's like usually, you know, simple sandwiches and a little veggie or fruit plate and then chips or something like that. You know, I was like, okay, well, I'll just take the fruit or the veggies, grab my sandwich, and I, I you know, I'll either just eat the meat or if it's like, you know, pretty minimum like there's like one slice of meat and in, in there and I was like okay well maybe I'll toss the top bread and eat half the bread because I just I need some substance so I'm going to sit yeah. here for this presentation for an hour I, be, I better get something in my stomach so yeah you just you know and I don't who cares right nobody nobody really cares right. if anything they're more like 
they're not judging like why is he they're like why is he do oh that is that something i could do like you know especially so, if you're sure. a presenter right then then yeah, those questions that's, <laughs> that, that's true that's yeah. true all right um i have a another burning question so you have a probably like you said a lot of clients corporate world busy not a ton of free time uh probably most of their free time goes to family time if they're not working i'm just making assumptions but what's the low hanging fruit you really like to go after that puts up or that most people have little resistance to incorporating what's the like real easy stuff that you're like okay just start with these because there's usually not a ton of barrier from a nutrition point of view or like yeah, or overall? nutrition lifestyle wh whatever you find usually works for most people that is easily incorporated yeah a little bit of yeah that. so my not to if well, we can if we want like a deep dive yeah. into my program or whatever but like i take a very holistic approach of ed part people's entire lives uh nutrition is just one aspect mm -hmm. of that so from a nutrition point of view it's typically again it depends what people's goals are so it's hard to one size fits all yeah. uh but just thinking of maybe the last few clients and you're pretty bang on with like busy you know executives you know any free time they do have they want to spend with their family uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're, you're pretty bang on with that again it's just making those small changes it's like uh you know if friday night's three glasses of wine like maybe two or if you're going to do it are you having like a biodynamic organic wine? I know you can afford it. So don't, don't give <laughs> me that, you know, like if you're going to do it, do it right. You know, if you're going to have, instead of having that beer, can you switch, switch to like a, a vodka on the rocks or something like that? Like those things, the coconut oil, you know, if you're going to, and it's sometimes like these, some, some of these people work with, like they eat a lot out for their work, like they're entertaining clients or their business functions. So I'm just like, okay, like what's the best choice you can make? Like order the steak get a side of vegetables, don't get the potato. Like you're still, you're not like asking for substitutions is not weird anymore, right? Like right. people get that even at, even in the business setting. Even I have uh, clients who like do a lot of traveling. It's like, well, look ahead of time. Is there a place nearby? Is there a little grocery store around the corner? You can pick up some eggs or whatever, you know, type of thing. So just from a nutrition point, those like minor things. Uh, I, I won't go through, I'll, I'll just give one more example here. But what I also find a lot of my clients, eh, yeah, probably 50, 50, again, that same sort of demographic, uh, they're all, you know, they're a type personality. And sometimes mm -hmm. that translate into, you know, they still want to be crushing their physical goals, right? Still want to run that, you know, triathlon. I still want to climb that mountain, uh, like literally climb mountains, yeah, right. uh, you know, et, et cetera. Right. And it's just like, you, you kind of get a, a sense of the plan. Like, dude, when do you rest? When do you do recovery? Well, I, I take Sundays off. I'm like, well, what, what does that look like? Well, I just don't do anything. Well, that's not recovery, right? Like you, I'm talking active recovery. So I find a lot of, and not all my clients are like that, but the ones that are that A type and that are, you know, you know, they could be in from late thirties to still, you know, even in their sixties, even they're still like doing those physical goals. It's like, you need to recover. We need to dial it back your exercise. And that trade-off of time is you need to do active recovery. Well, I don't know what's foam rolling, what's massage, what's blah, 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 you know, type of thing. So that's another thing that's actually really, I find like low hanging fruit is like dial it back a bit and let's add mm -hmm. some of this in. Like you'll feel actually a lot better. You'll actually perform better. You know? I love that. Yeah. That's a, my issue. I've had that issue forever because I, my metabolism usually just gives me boundless energy, but not really. It's a it's kind of an illusion. Like I'll be if I use all of that, I'll just crash. So my problem has been with um, incorporating enough recovery time because usually I, especially when I was trying to put on weight uh, coming out of farming and I was just doing bodybuilding style and just tired all the time. I don't think people understand and it took me a while to get that um, exercise is inflammation, like unless you're just walking, which is perfect. But like anything where, like you said earlier, chronic. So that black hole zone of training where you're no longer going light enough to be taking enough oxygen and you're just sucking air. What most people think of getting a workout in is taxing and creating a lot of oxidative damage, which you need to recover from. So I think that's a, that's a mindset barrier for, for a lot of people, myself included, although I've gotten better at it. Have you found any, um, any tricks to give to people other than showing them the data as to sort of what's happening metabolically and how much 
more they can perform if they do take enough recovery time. Have you found any uh, any good way to sort of get people to dial it back or to show them show them the difference? Yeah. So one thing I like, I mean, I do this personally. I mean, if people are going to do what they're going to do and it depends on their lifestyle, what they have time for some executive, well, it doesn't matter what he'll make the time to do three days a week, two hours in the gym. He just likes that. And other guys like struggling. I want to go to the gym. How do I get in there? So everyone teach their own and what they can fit in and what their goals are. Obviously I'm really, you know, even when it comes to strength training, I really like hit strength training. Yeah. Boom in done fast, still going to get all the benefits again depending on their goals, what, what, they're, what they're trying to do. Uh, but just, it's really just to show them, like, just try this, just try this, see how it goes. Uh, and it could be, you know, uh, as an example, it's like, okay, set it, you know, going to wherever to the big box gym or whatever, and doing your regular routine. How about this? Why don't you just try some, you know, body weight squats? Oh, that's too easy. That's too light. Blah, blah, blah. I, I put 300 pounds on my back. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Well, do you have some 50 pound dumbbells? Yeah, I got that. Okay. Do some 50 pound dumbbells, body weight squats and throw blood flow restriction bands on and tell me you're not dead afterwards, you know, and you did it in a third of the time. Now this time you have, you can actually stretch after you can actually stretch after you did your, cause a lot of these guys, like I got my time in shower, suit back on or whatever back to the office or rush home because i got to help go to the kids soccer game whatever there's no time for recovery or active recovery and i was like no you have to make time and i from experience not everyone has back issues although some people come to me because they know my back oh, sure. and, yeah. and they want to want that but take it from me you're doesn't matter how old you are you want to protect your spine so again i show them some if they're interested show my whole routine not that it's the best be all end all but protect your spine, keep your core strong. Again, for me, that's knee to shoulders so that you can have long, even things you don't worry about now. We're talking that we're playing the lawn game here, right? Like what, what do you want to be able to do 20, 30, 40 years from now? Let's start working on now. And that includes not only strength, but recovering properly, stretching, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I love that. Uh, right. Stability and mobility, core strength, are kind of the foundation of all movement. And that's the thing you notice first, if anything goes wrong, thing that you appreciate most when you get older. So that's usually you lose your mobility first whenever you start getting older. And that's where people notice the, it's kind of a, leads into depression because you can't do like your vehicle that you're operating isn't functioning and you can't make it. So no amount of willpower or visualization will necessarily get that back without invasive surgery. So it's always worthwhile to do that now. Even when I was in my early twenties or this happens a lot when, when you're a kid, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's cute. The stretching and mobility stuff. It's like, I just need to, I need performance. And they're like, it will only take one injury to knock you out for weeks or months for you to take this seriously. You don't want that to happen. So you'll tear something or something will happen to your lumbar spine. Um, something like a, yeah, anything in your hips, shoulder impingement, knees, like your body's pretty adaptable, except when you do repetitive damage all the time. And it only takes one of those focal points to just lay you out for months and then you'll take it seriously. So the goal is to obviously do the work. So you never really have to experience that. Oh, that's why they're telling me to do that. Take it from everyone who's, who's been laid out for a while. Yeah, when, uh, I don't know if you do this with your clients. I'll, I'll do this with mine from the movement point of view. Uh, again, I take a very broad spectrum approach to their health. But, you know, somebody's like a type again, sort of this stereotypical person and I can do this and that and bench and whatever and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, I'll do functional movement tests, tests with them. It's like, and they can't even do sits to stand. I was like, okay, your core is weak. Like you're, waste, why are, you're wasting your time. Right. You can't even do this. You know, it's like, how are you going to, you know, do you have kids? Yeah, I got young kids. Do you play on the floor? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, but you need to use like a knee and a hand to get up. Right. What about 30 years from now when you have grandkids? Would you like to play with them? Yeah, of course. You know, it's like, what, what do you think you're going to look like then if you can't do this now? Oh, like, you know, it's kind of the thing, you know, and, and yeah. there's obviously other tests as well, right? So but it's very simple, like very, people have to be actually be pretty I don't want to say fit, but they have to have decent core strength to be able to sit to stand properly, right? It and has to lot, be trained. 
Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people can't do it. Many people can't do it. So I was like, okay, why are you wasting your stuff with this? I don't care if you can do 500 pounds under the squat rack. If you can't do that, like, and, unless that's your goal, unless that you're a professional, whatever, like that's a different story. I'm talking about the average people, yeah. right? I, I don't, I don't work with elite athletes. So I work with average Joe and Jane. Yeah. Same. I, I will have people do um, hangs, which is so depressing when you can't hang for 45 seconds, just with your own body weight um, or any sort of movement compensation, like you said. So the body is extremely good at getting the job done and it will mobilize whatever it needs to and compensate wherever it needs to, to just um, get you out of danger. I mean, that's the purpose of that is so you don't die. So like you said, you can, your body will move the weight, but probably not correctly and not using the, the correct core strength, correct form. So if you start those real basic exercises, like a single leg squat that require almost no real strength, like if we're doing uh, power lifting type strength, but a whole bunch of stability and it's so humbling. And that that's usually a, a good barometer. Like you said, just like either unilateral you know, exercise and you're like, you're not moving any weight you're literally just keeping yourself in your center of gravity. And that's a lot of good, good advice for a good way to test your core. Do anything on one side or um, yeah, don't use any support. Don't sit on something, make yourself balance. It takes a lot more energy too. So people get winded so quickly. Yeah. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought a balance because that's something I always work in with uh, people uh, regardless of age, but especially if they're, you know, in their fifties, sixties, it's like, you got to do balance work. If you're not doing balance work, what are you like? you're setting yourself, you're potentially setting yourself up for disaster. So you have to do balance. It actually surprises me. Uh, well, one, not, not to throw, you know, the running community under the bus, but many, how many don't do strength training. And if they do, they don't do single leg. When are you ever running on two legs? Never <laughs> do single leg, uh, you know, strength training. So anyway, that's it. And single leg all or unilateral single side, anything reveals usually drastic imbalances. Okay, so you know, one side is always yeah, so much stronger and you're like, I have almost no strength on your, and sometimes it's the opposite of your dominant side. So like my uh, left arm actually has way better performance than my right arm. And that might just be because it's chronic. It's not always chronically fatigued. Same with my left side of my lower, my left legs are actually way stronger, but uh, you don't know what your body's doing until you test parts of it because it'll, Absolutely. it'll make it happen. Yeah. And then hopefully you can avoid um, doing any surgery in the future. Like you said, a balance, usually at like the classic story is someone falls and breaks their hip and that cascades into a nightmare scenario of something when they're in their seventies or eighties, it's always something with balance. Hey, number one cause of death for people over 65 is falls. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's always worthwhile to have, um, when off center, off center gravity stability and being able to like reach for something. And like you said, um, in your, um, how you messed up your lower back, it was, you were chronically training and you went to pick up a very light weight, probably didn't have perfect form when you did it. And it doesn't take much. No, uh, that inflamed. Yeah. So my knees, quads, super inflamed from right. the chronic running. So it totally bent over at the back. I was actually picking up uh, like a five pound dumbbell. Yep. That's what, that's what did it. Doesn't take much. No. Yeah. B big lesson. So anyone listening, take it from us. It does. The weight doesn't matter. You're just like, Oh, I'll be able to do yard work. Or I just made a video on yard work. Um, Cause of the, I was doing some storm cleanup and mostly for myself. I was like, make sure you treat this like a workout. It's usually not at the gym people get injured because you're conscious of your form, hopefully, or you do a proper warm up, you do a little core. So your body's kind of primed and holding yourself. It's when you're golfing, it's when you're doing uh, picking up large limbs and you just don't pay attention. You didn't do the proper warm up. you're twisting and it's some weird angle or twisting that people will feel something tear when, when you're not in, yeah, and for 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 those of us uh, who live in more northern climates, snow shoveling, right? Yeah, oh, you got to yeah. warm up, and you got to have good form. Otherwise, you're just asking for disaster. Yeah, people have heart attacks all the time. I'm from New Hampshire, and that yeah. was one of the things. Is like if you just change the temperature drastically, do nothing to prepare yourself. You you're not active, so your heart's not going to be used to that dramatic shift in 
blood pressure and everything. And then you just are rounding your back and twisting whole bunch of things could go wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. Her, her. Yeah. Good advice. Um, what do you find ends up being, I'm assuming there's a lot of mindset or maybe visualization in your coaching, any of that that you utilize at the start just to give people a good amount. Yeah. Of- so what I typically do is again, I don't really care what people's diet is if, or what they identify is I'm yep. this, I'm a that, whatever. I don't care. We can optimize it though. And I, you know, we'll use genetic testing and stuff uh, as well. And, and I've certainly done a lot of that as well. Um, but what I typically ask, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a macros guy. I'm not a counting calories not guy either. or nothing. Like, no, no, I actually think that's kind of useless. But what I do ask my clients to do is just do a minimum, a two week log. I just want to get a baseline of what a typical period looks like. So I can find where are the small things we can tweak, where are the Same. easy wins. So while they're doing that, I mean, mindset is so important. It's like probably the number one uh, thing that is going to carry out throughout the entire engagement with somebody, but spe- specifically front loaded those first couple of weeks while they're just, we're not even going to talk about nutrition until I see that log. We're not going to talk about water. We're not going to talk about supplements blah, blah, blah. We're not even talking about exercise, no, nothing. Those first couple of weeks, we're going to work about mindset, all facets. And, and you know, I'm going to, we're going to really dig into their backstory. Uh, I, I've had a client in the past where, you know, they were on some medications and okay, great. So we talked about that because of, you know, anxiety. So how did that come out? And it's some addictive stuff in their past. You, know, you dig into it and you boil it down to like, you know, some issues with their parents when they were growing up that led to this cascade of stuff to where they're at now. So, okay, mindset, you know, it's like, well, have you ever talked about your parents? Well, no. And, you know, that took some coaxing because that's not an easy conversation, but, you know, eventually they had some difficult conversations with their parents. And at the end of the day, it was like, he, he, he was better for it. Their relationship was stronger for it. Um, and that's all stuff that the seed was planted in the first couple of weeks. It took, a long time to get to that point and, and coming back to it and coming back to it. But yeah, so mindset, uh, mindset and motivation is kind of what, what I call it is super important. Uh, I mean, to a degree, I try and get that before I even start working with somebody, I want to be, work with somebody who's, who's committed, who's, uh, you know, going to be engaged in the process. Uh, so, you know, some of that's the pre-screening as well, but once they come on board then we're like, okay, now we're really going to dig into it because it's super important. Like nothing happens downstream to use that terminology if it's not already working on up here so yeah it has to be in the internal landscape before it's even remotely reflected externally I, yeah, yeah i completely agree you have to start the change in the mind first and then the body follows there's ways to reverse that too but for the vast majority of people mindset will well it changes your perspective it changes the way you filter things so it changes what you actually see in the world. So you can change your filtration mechanisms to see uh, more healthy food or barriers, um, different ways that lead you to success, right? So it's a good way to utilize all of that unused brain power to actually filter the world in your favor, as I usually like to. Yeah. So like I work with people for a year, my program is a year long with them. So we have, we have, we have time, right? You got time. Right. But also at the same time, I want people who one, not only committed to the program, but also committed to like that long-term goal. They're playing the long game with their health. So people like, you know, Hey, I have a girlfriend's wedding in four months. Can you help me? Like, I, yeah, I can, but I, that's not, I, I, I don't want to work with you. Like, you know, I, I'm obviously more polite than that, but uh, that's not what I do. I, w- I want to work with people who have that long-term vision who want, you know, even after the year's done, they're in a solid position where they're like, yeah, I'm good for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years because they understand they might not at the beginning they might say okay it's a year and I want to get to here but somewhere along that way I haven't had a client yet who when they've come to graduate is like like I, I look at xyz differently now I look at the long-term view and, and it could be it could be their grandkids that they don't even have yet it could be you know uh, appreciation for their body and things they could do I used to hike and then life happened and I can never hike now. I was like, I'm back to hiking. Right. You know, that type of thing. So it changes the bar. It changes your yeah. perception of your possibilities. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's, that's crucial to what I do as well as um, 
I don't purposely make them think that far down the line, but the goal is, and I think this is what makes health coaching a little different than most other coaching is most of the programs I, I know from other health coaches are designed so that when they leave your care, they shouldn't need to come back. I mean, obviously people are going to uh, some degree, but it's right. Set them up so that they have the tools to add more tools to your toolbox so that even if you don't know exactly, remember what we said, you know where to look or you know what resources you need to find to get there yourself rather than having to rely on an external authority. Absolutely. Like yeah. I also like that you said planted seeds a couple, uh, couple of minutes ago. As far as mindset, I always think of that literally because that's part of my thing is uh, encouraging people to start growing uh, vegetables for themselves, do microgreens, do garden stuff. So there's always a metaphor. That's partially why I encourage people to start growing is because uh, there's always a mirror reflection to yourself. So as you keep growing, the plants will mirror needs lessons back to you. So it's the exact same thing as, as you growing internally is uh, mistakes you learn or mistakes, lessons you learn. Uh, they're kind of a quick growing way of trial and error and the same same concepts apply. So it's a, it's a cool dichotomy. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take a little twist on that one. And I'm sure you're familiar with like the bamboo, how the bamboo grows, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So it's like all this work, all this work, where's the progress? Don't worry. We're building on something. We're building on something. And all of a sudden that shoot comes up and then boom, Our rockets, ma massive gain, right? Massive transformation, whatever that is for that person yeah. really quickly. When you thought, geez, nothing's happening here. Yeah. So I think James Clear had that too in Atomic Habits. It was mathematically if you get one percent better every day there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing and then you hit a compound and it exponentially yeah. skyrockets yeah so that's that's what people see it's uh, you don't notice the incremental progress until you stacked enough of them and then you start getting sort of compound interest hitting and you start doing the three percent five percent temp like it just grows quickly so it's put in the initial grind the the grudging which is where kind of the discipline um and the habits are building and then like after usually it's a month in or a month and a half for my programs people are like oh okay that's when the met metabolism really starts changing and things get a little easier and then they start focusing on other things and bigger things i had uh, one guy who just needed to be able to get a workout in because he traveled a lot, couldn't get in the gym ever. We tried to do that for a while and it never worked. So resistance bands and body weight challenges finally stuck. And then once he got that under his belt, then he started thinking about trail running and right. So it's an, it's a growth curve. Once you hit that, um, that self, the internal motivation, the discipline, and you are confident in yourself and you're like, Oh, let's see how far I can take this still within reason. Like, I don't know that I'm going to encourage him to do a marathon. Like you said, just because chronic damage, but something where you can get outside and like trail running, in my opinion, it's just a good one, especially if you can keep it, keep it minimized, low impact, uh, and just enjoying nature and things like that. So many benefits, but that's why I love seeing people just stick with it. And then they notice that, um, the possibilities, sort of open up once they get one thing down and then it just takes off. Yeah. I love seeing that in people. Yeah. Me too. Me too. So, so powerful when they, they see that they recognize that transformation in themselves. Yep. Yeah. And then our role becomes less so, and we just get to, to watch and cheer and it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you work primarily with long-term is your focus on metabolism or everything, just lifestyle in general? So you said long game. Yeah. So if I had to put a label on it, yeah. I would say it's probably like anti-aging longevity. Okay. That's so a good one. I, if any, I, if any goal, that's a good goal. Yeah. So I mean, and obviously- I do want to become a that is a stated publicly stated goal for sure. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just be, I'm realistic in the fact that I know how much damage I probably did to myself in my teens and twenties and even my mid thirties before things turned around for me that I'm like, man, 130, 140, that might be pushing it because I probably do have a lot of damage, even with new tech and all that. So I'm like, no, 100, 110. I'm good with that. 
I'm good with that. If I can see my great, great gang crits, I'm good with that and be able to pick them up and still have, you know, uh, functionality and all that. So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's probably the, the, if I had to put a label on my, on my program, but again, we touch on like, uh, I kind of have seven buckets, uh, and there's obviously multiple topics in, in each one, nutrition, or, you know, I call it glycemic variability, uh, movement is another one, which, you know, includes both strength training and sort of cardio, uh, mindset, uh, motivation. We talked about, um, a minute ago, et cetera, et cetera, even then to, you know, the, the last one and they all interweave. It's not like if yes. you do this, then you do this. It's just whatever the client needs that day and what their goals are, et cetera. But then there's also the, the, to use an over, overused term, the biohacking, yep. the fringe, the science, the cutting edge, whether that be stem cells, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, that can be weaved in as well. If the, if they're ready for it. Right? I think that's probably the most exciting field to watch because there's so much money and, and research being done in anti-aging and it's, well, I shouldn't say longevity, anti-aging has been the word forever, but, uh, the amount of epigenetic research that's being done, the amount of research on telomeres and their role, uh, the amount of medicinal herbs that are now being discovered to touch telomeres like Jagulon. I just noticed, I follow a couple of channels that, that make specific formulations of ginseng and Jagulon, which, um, have been used for millennia in Chinese medicine, but now have the studies on them. They're like, oh, these will actually prevent telomere shortening. So a couple of those like drastic, really easy to do things that will uh, give you a little more longevity as well as autophagy and just the cellular cleanup and cooling your metabolism down a little more. Fasting is probably the low hanging fruit for most people. And a lot of large promises have been made in the media about fasting and you're like, don't even pay attention to all that. It's just that it's what it allows your body to do. Like you don't necessarily need to, it's how to make it sustainable for people. So you're like, you don't need to do three to five day fasts all the time. <laughs> That's pretty stressful too. Just incorporate it like you do into your everyday life and enjoy the benefits. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a nice segue. So it hasn't been really, I don't know when this podcast will be uh, released from when we're recording. Soon. Uh, so probably my article might be out after or right about the same time, but I actually did just uh, the May long weekend. I did, uh, my, my family was away. So I was home by myself. So all those temptations that my daughter wanting pizza, I said, all that was all eliminated. So I actually did a four day fast just to, oh. just to try it. I never done before. I, yep. you know, I quite often just by accident is like, Oh, it's been 23 hours since I ate. I'll just go another hour, like whatever. Like it's, I've done that a few times, right? Where it's just, you're just busy. So, but I was purposefully doing it. Uh, so I have a series of uh, a small posts that are going to be coming out uh, about my experience and what I actually realized from it. And, and it's, it's not going to be, oh, I lost weight. I, right. the, what most people, like you said, the media, what they yeah. kind of paintbrush it's going to be a little bit more interesting. So yeah, if I could just, I'll just tease that if anyone's, I would love whoever, to see those, whoever yeah. is watching the, this, uh, check out uh, my website for those series of blog posts on my fasting, my four day fasting experience. So. Send me those whenever you, uh, whenever you do sure. pub yeah. publish them and I will, even if this is up, I'll just edit the show notes and, and tag them in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious what you notice Cause it's always interesting if you're, <clears throat> A lot of the stories we get from people who do keto or metabolic change or fasting are if they go from standard American diet to the extreme. So if you go from eating pizza, uh, mac and cheese, whatever, to a three-day fast, and it's just like, you that's not the easiest way to do it. It's always a different story if you've built that metabolic flexibility, built the metabolic machinery. If you played with IF before, like you said, it's kind of seamless into the beginning of it. And then it's just, okay, let's see what the rest of this feels like. So it's a completely different ball game. If, if you've done the initial training, nutritional and, and movement based training so that your body doesn't go into shock whenever it happens. I'm curious what, what you detail. Yeah. I'll, I'll just share this one thing. So again, mm -hmm. I've done 24, 25 hours a few times. My, my regular routine is 16 to 18, yeah. you know, somewhere like, so that's, that's no big deal. And I've been doing that for years, probably five years or something like that. So, so going two full days was like a breeze, right? Like I didn't really even notice anything, um, till sort of day three. So I'll just leave it at that. And okay. Leave it, leave that as a cliffhanger for yep. people to actually oh, read the article. So, yeah. 
Okay, I think we covered most of the things I wanted to. Was there any other glaring topic that that you wanted to chat about? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. And I, I'll just, you know, I, I'm sure people are well aware. You know, I, I hope they are, and I'm sure you've talked about it before. It's just like there's no one size fits all no. yeah. for anyone, whether it's movement, whether it's nutrition, sleep, even for that matter. Uh, it's very individualized. So uh, again, uh, not to talk about my program, but again, it's very highly individualized, highly curated to the individual. Uh, and again, that takes into account data, you know, like my clients need to get genetic testing. They need to get an aura ring and, you know, we'll see what, because what works for them is not what works for their wife or their I kids. might have you back to talk about uh, heart, rate, heart rate variability, a couple of things we didn't touch on sleep, um, stress, stress mitigation. I know there's a ton of that, I'm sure with type A individuals or just busy executives. So we might do a part two with diving into this more of the, the nitty gritty. Well, let, let me, okay. I'd love to do a part two. So let me tease this for part yes. two. So a lot of these folks, again, what they see in them, I mean, obviously some people, they realize, okay, I'm carrying too much extra weight or whatever. And they think that's their problem. That's no, that's a symptom in my opinion of a bigger problem, but okay. But actually a lot of them actually recognize like, I have anxiety, I can't sleep, I wake up at four in the morning thinking about that meeting I have coming up or a project I need to do, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they think they want and what they come to me for often. But again, great, we can handle that. And they don't even realize you're gonna get all the other seven buckets at the same time working with me. And we'll definitely handle your stress, your anxiety, et cetera. Oh, by the way, we're gonna bring your inflammation down through nutrition, through blah, 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 right? So. That's why I swapped into health coaching from, I started as a personal trainer, just because that's kind of the easier, more targeted, you know, like I'm going to help people. This is probably the most effective way. And then you quickly realize that it doesn't make as much of an impact or a lasting metabolic change. There's no lifestyle shift. There's no mindset shift. There's no nutrient. You're missing too many other pieces. So you'll, you'll definitely put on a little muscle and you'll see a little change, but you, I, I just swapped to exactly like you said, the full package, because that's the only place people see lasting change. And it gives them all of the tools they need so that they don't have to come back for, I mean, people might come back for just a new workout routine or something just to spice it up, but uh, just so it's not a constantly needing a coach because you're missing sleep part, you're missing the um, how to deal with traveling part, all of that, like you said, it needs to be all inclusive or, or there's no real lasting change. Yeah. And can I, I share? I don't know if you know before, this about me, but I'll show Yeah. So, so before I, I was already, like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of our conversation, I was already getting into the research about performance mm -hmm. from a running perspective that when I injured myself and now the research changed to how to heal my back. And then I just got into everything performance everything optimization everything so when i made the decision i'm going to do this i'm going to do a career change just like you i started with like okay i think personal training is the is the quickest thing i can do but i already knew i wanted i knew it was going to be more i was probably going to be focused on nutrition because that was the biggest driver for me yeah. for my change was bringing inflammation down through nutrition when i went to uh, do my course i was fortunate enough that the person teaching my course uh, had been in the industry a long time, had, you know, seen the ups and downs, all the negatives of, of the weight loss industry, the personal training industry, et cetera, uh, you know, had a very realistic view. Uh, and, and they were very clear with us as students as like, there's no one size fits all. There's no, you know, if you wanted this, you have to have so many grams per body weight, protein, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're very open. So I was like, so that was good. It was a, it was a perfect, per and it, that was just random perfect person to teach me what I was doing that. But I knew it was nutrition. So even though I'm a certified personal trainer, I've never trained a person since I, I used to train people earlier and younger mm -hmm. would not even know anything like, oh, this is what I read in the, in the bodybuilding magazine. And it worked for me or worked for my friend. So I'll help you middle-aged lady train or whatever. Like I was totally, you know, just at the local gym or whatever, because somebody just asked me yeah. uh, type of thing. When I actually got properly certified, I've never actually trained one person because that's not my interest. I mean, obviously movement, what I call movement, which is strength training then is is important piece, but I don't do that in isolation. So it's kind of sort of, sort of similar in our Yeah, in our if, if you want to actually make impact, uh, it, there has to be, it has to be full package, has to be a holistic approach just because movement is a great 
uh, facet and resistance training is a huge, will give you a huge buffer and will incorporate a lot of those metabolic changes you're looking for. But if you don't change anything else around it, the inflammation is still a pain in the butt to deal with. And it's going to be a major factor in, in hindrance for growing at all. Just you can put on muscle under it, but other than that, you, you still might be just a whole bunch of damage happening. Like you, like you experienced. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. What is the, uh, if people wanted to a look at your post when it comes out and just, uh, look at your approach to things, what is your, um, sort of the thing you pay attention to social media wise most, like where would people follow you? Yeah. So, I mean, certainly people can come to my website. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I have uh, two, so I have a uh, Deepak Saini, uh, health, Dot com. Mm -hmm. It's kind of my overarching one. And then uh, my program that I mentioned alluded to a few times is uh, personal blue zones with S at the end, uh, dot com again, blue zones, you know, longevity, like uh, et, yeah. et cetera. I'm uh, probably the most active on just coming from my corporate background. Uh, you know, I built a quite a following on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's probably a good place to follow me. Uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter too. So everything gets pretty much everywhere, uh, but probably the most engaging or where I communicate most with people is uh is probably linkedin actually so okay good to know i'll put all of that in the show notes and if anyone is interested in your approach they will hopefully go uh, go watch and longevity is a, a huge thing uh trendy even now so i mean it's it shouldn't be trendy because it doesn't really go away but that's probably of massive importance and interest to a lot of people. You know what, what, what I find, I don't know, maybe I, I, we don't, I don't want to take up too much time more time it's here, fine. but I find for, you know, people like us who are close to or in this industry and do research and, you know, are part of this. Yeah. We see it a lot. Longevity seems right. trendy, but when I go out to the everyday pe oh, person, yeah. they don't know about longevity. No one's thinking that, you know, so uh, Yes, it's growing. Absolutely. I totally believe it, but I think it's still with a small subset of population. That, that's is. just my, my take. No, you're right. I get a, a wake up call whenever, because even whenever you're trying to become a health coach, you're just like, you, you're in that world and you're like, everyone's a health coach. This is a saturated market. How am I ever going to? And then you go into the real world and you're like, right, nope, that's, that's my bubble. <laughs> no one knows any of this. I mean, people do, but right. You're, or the places you'll shop are usually more in line with your diet. And those are the places that are more likely to cater to that crowd, but that's still one to 5% of the population. So, right. It's, it's always get out of your bubble and, uh, and right. There are plenty of people interested and, they'll follow your specific interest in it and yeah. you are clearly passionate enthusiastic about it so that i'm sure will come through all of your work i, I don't want to get you get this uh podcast taken down or banned but uh That'd just just go to a uh, walmart or a mcdonald's and tell me if people are thinking about longevity <laughs> i'm on every platform there's no way they could ban it don't worry yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we do need to do a part two. We'll talk about some of the more uh, niche topics, heart rate variability, sleep optimization, all of those uh, sort of biohacking and, and metric tracking things that, that are always very fascinating. I'm looking forward to it. That'd nice. be awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Deepak. No, I appreciate it. Gratitudes for having me on. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye.